yeah, this woman told me I had a radiant smile. Oh, you and do. And she said, from the moment I first saw you across the road, Whoa. I felt that you were radiant. Did you have a little romance with uh, the, the young squirrel? I did not. Were you hoping you would? I, 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 oh, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, it that's was. A, that's a yes. That's a very long, long yes. Yeah. Ooh, whenever someone goes, oh, yeah, you, uh, it's either Helen Keller stuck in an elevator or it's a long winded yes. Yeah. You're riding down the Harland Highway. All right. Harland Williams. And then this thing just like twisted around like a like a dirty. Do you leak, do you eat uh, licorice at like uh, when you go to the movie theater? Uh, not the black stuff. No, the red stuff. Nay, hey, I'm a, I'm a, like a popcorn guy, and I like to get the mm -hmm. uh, even if I'm by myself, I like to get the largest tub. No way. Why? It just something. It just feels like going to the movies. I just like have holding a big tub and. Can you eat it all though? Like they're when you say big tub, they're like <clears throat> giant. Yeah, you can eat that whole thing. Uh, not always, but you know, just something. I like. There's something comforting about you know. Why get the little, little tiny bag? So there's something comforting about eating a tub of popcorn and walking out, and you look like you're pregnant. That's comforting, guy. Yeah. So let me, let's just break down. Are you Have good we at, started? Are you good at, <laughs> we're not starting until we get through this. Are you good at math? No. Okay, so I'm not great at math, but let's break it down. If you got a tub of popcorn this big, yeah, that's probably, what, 700 kernels of popped corn in there? Okay. So you figure the average cob of corn has, what, maybe 40, 50 kernels? More than that, I think. So basically, you're eating like nine corn on the cob. Yeah. Well, you watch like a movie. Yeah. That's comforting. It is. Bro, I'm never going to a salad bar with you, I'll tell you that. Christ on a Christmas cracker. And I don't know if you're religious, but I'm going to say a Christ on a Christmas cracker. That's the best kind of Christ. Um. Okay, so, dude... Before we get into anything else, by the way, Tom Rhodes, ladies and gentlemen. Let's, we have started. Let's, we've started, and here comes the theme music. <laughs> uh-huh, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. You're on the Holland Highway podcast, and I uh, want to welcome my guest, Tom Rhodes, comedian, actor, uh, Mona Lisa stand-in. That's kind of a Mona Lisa smile you just did, like the half sort of... Yeah, what, why was that? Why didn't she ever show teeth? I think she was um, uh, trying to hold in some flatulence. Oh, the Mona Lisa had gas. Yep. I always wondered if it's because, the, like, during the Renaissance, wasn't that when, the, when Black Death, the, the Black Plague was around? Yep. Maybe she just had horrible, like, gum disease or something. Have you ever seen it in the Louvre? It's, it's yeah. actually really tiny. The, the Mona Lisa? The Mona Lisa is tiny. No. Yeah, it's not that big at all. It's like... It's not that big. It's tiny. I've seen it. Have you seen it in real life? I've stood in front of it. It's Me too. It's tiny. Are you sure you weren't at a postage stamp festival? No, I've been there. It's tiny. It's not that, it's not that tiny, it's guy. It's not that tiny. Yeah. No. Okay. Let's let's. Um, I sort of remember it being like. Neither around. one of us are good at math, so what right, is, we could get the measurements. It would mean nothing to us. Wow! Imagine getting Mona Lisa's measurements. What do you think? A D cup? Thirty six double D. Oh, and no teeth. Mm. What a night on the town in Bakersfield <laughs> that would be. Mona Lisa moaning in room twelve oh nine at the Bakersfield uh, Motel Six. Yeah, maybe her name was just Lisa, and she moaned a lot. Yeah. I never thought I never right? put that together until yeah. you just spoke she's, those words. She's a moaner. I wonder if Da Vinci ever painted the the squirter Lisa. <laughs> Jello, but wait, no, it wasn't that big, was it? Is that? <clears throat> when? I mean, it's it's for it's 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 smallish. When did you see it? What year? Um, I'd say about ten years ago. Because I saw it, I think about twenty years ago. It got smaller. They washed it. Uh, do you think they washed it? It shrunk. 
Because it's been kicking around since the Renaissance, right? Yeah. So it's how many years is, is that? It's probably... Well, then there was a story... You know the story where it was stolen? And it was shot. And... Someone shot it. <laughs> and stole it. Well, there was a guy... He was an Italian guy, and he worked, I guess, for the Louvre, and he stole it, <sighs> wanting to bring it back for Italy. But, you know, uh-huh. the, the king of France had brought... Leonardo da Vinci to France, and it actually it never belonged to Italy, and, yeah. and neither did Leonardo da Vinci at that point. Right, but the guy was like a security guard or something. It's a fascinating story. I don't know why. It, Not no a very is, good security guard if but, people are stealing right under his nose. But but he stole it and he kept it un- again. Not a good security guard was, if you're stealing. I, I think, mean, yeah, who no uh, background you know, check apparently. I mean, but uh, I don't think the guy was making that much money, and he kept it under his bed. So I'm guessing the guy oh might have had like a studio apartment. No so. wonder she was Mona Lisa. Yeah, I mean, this guy. How, how often did he hum? <laughs> I mean, you got you're under some creepy security guard's mattress. Yeah, you're gonna you you got you're Mona Lisa by default. I'm guessing he had a he had a, like a little army cot or something. So an army like, what? Cot. Okay, I'm just <laughs> dude, you got to enunciate around here. <laughs> I mean, God, we're talking about Mona Lisa here, dude. What is wrong with us? Um, have you have you ever been to the Dorsey Museum in Paris? <laughs> the what? The Dorsey. That's not real. It is you real. Made that up. No. Wait. You, where is it? It's in Paris. I actually like that better than the Louvre. <laughs> well, how big are the paintings there? They're massive. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wait. What did you see? You couldn't th- keep any of those under your bed. You couldn't. They're huge. The, most of them are pretty big. <sighs> the the dose. Especially you walk in and there's one called the Decadence of Rome. And Ooh, it's um, by who? I don't know. Probably Duran Duran or someone. That sounds yeah. like one of theirs. <laughs> yeah. The decadence of Rome. Da, na, 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 na. Right? Yeah. It's got to be a Duran Duran. Yeah. Or Kajagugu. Oh, no thanks. I'm straight. <laughs> <laughs> I always wondered what that meant. It, it is, a, is it a secret code to pick somebody up? Is it? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Did you say Kajagugu? Kajagugu. Wow, you know, in Afghanistan, you say that on the street, they'll hang you. Wow. Yeah, you know what it means in mm. Afghani? No. Go there someday, see what happens. One of my favorite dogs is the Afghan. You know, those, oh, they're yeah. beautiful dogs. Yeah. They're just amazing, mm. and they have long necks, and they yeah. got the fabulous hair. Yeah. How come during the Afghan war, you never saw any of those running around in the background? Right. Because during Nazi Germany, you saw tons of German shepherds. Right. So where were the Afghans? Where were the Afghans? Maybe they're draft dodgers. Maybe they're in <laughs> Cleveland or something. <laughs> they're in Canada. Maybe they're in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking draft dodgers. Yeah. Not, not so pretty when you factor that in. <sighs> Hairy whores. At least they'll Cowards. stay warm. <laughs> <Yeah>. Cowards. <laughs> Yellow bastards. Um, yeah, the Mona Lisa, bro. I don't get the hype about her. Like, you know, she's one of the most iconic images on planet Earth. Yeah. She's a very mediocre looking girl. Like if she was on Instagram today, probably maybe 1,200 followers. Not a hottie. Don't think she'd sport a bikini very well. I mean. I've thought about this recently. I, I think oil paintings were the original Instagram. Yeah, that's true. You know, because they didn't have camera phones back then. You know, I imagine how long it took to do a selfie. Probably a day and a half. You ever worked with the oils? It hey, takes forever selfie. for it to dry. <laughs> Don't move, asshole. <laughs> a day and a half later. Hey. Yeah. But would you, would you go? I mean, she was very sort of plain Jane. Mona Lisa. Hmm. Would, you, would you date her? Um, Be honest. I, I you know, I, I like, I love people for their insides, Harlan. Okay, but if you flip her if around, she was funny, she's only this fucking uh, thing. Sense of humor is so. really attractive. Maybe she was hilarious. Maybe she was like thinking of like a dirty joke or something. That's why she had the little yeah, cracked she, smile. She, yeah, she did have the little... There, there's a bit of, of mischief in her smile, isn't there? Yeah. She was a little bit doughy. A little bit, would you say, pudgy? Uh, I'm not fat shaming the Mona Lisa. Well, I said pudgy, which is sort of like flubbery. You know, you're uh, you're fat. You're Canadian, yeah. And um, in the last couple of years, yeah, 
I've I've done my best to avoid the news. Good, I don't know if we've smart. had this conversation. Or yeah. Not. Because uh, it's depressing, and I don't get any jokes out of it. But right. when I listen to the news, because I have satellite radio, I oh. listen to the CBC news. The Canadian Broadcasting and it's Corporation. it's so much happier and friendly, and in the morning, really? they're, not, they're not bombarding you with, like, pain and death and destruction. They'll interview writers and um, musicians, and it's, huh. you know, they'll do, like, the news at the top of the hour, but it's, like, brief, and it's not, like, all opinion and, like... Yeah. It's uh, it, it, and like they've they've got the most l- lovely uh, programs on there. Like uh, last year, I heard a show. It was an hour program, and it was songs that featured whistling. Mm. And they played like the top ten songs uh, that Benny and the Jets. Uh, did they whistle in that song? Yeah, but- Benny, Benny. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. The, the whistling is a prominent part of that well, song. The Andy Griffith theme song. Was was on there? That was one of them. Oh, I thought you meant like pop radio tunes. Yeah, yeah, but like song pop, like it's songs throughout history or you know popular songs. Okay, go. You uh, said Andy Griffin. Uh, well, I can't remember, but but that just shows you how lovable the Canadian Broadcasting Company is. And then uh, there was another uh, segment where they they talked about how to get an uh, extra inch on your souffle, and you know that song by the Scorpions. The Winds of Change, that one? I, I nailed it, didn't I? You got it. <laughs> What's the one by Guns N' Roses? Patience. Patience. How yeah. does that? <laughs> you can't whistle? <laughs> Not really. Uh-uh. Dude, what are you doing? That's like. Can you do that like finger whistle? No, that, what were you just doing? That's, <laughs> uh, that was like a starfish scraping along a coral reef. What? <laughs> You're like the sea flea, slea stack from Land of the Lost. I love slea stacks. <laughs> what were you doing over there, guy? God, Stephen King's creep show. Anyway, on the Canadian news, <laughs> yeah, there sorry. Was, in Banff, well, like last month, there was a bear murdered two people. Did you see that? No way. What did you use a knife or how did how did? Yeah, he... it did. And uh, and the the Canadian broadcasting company said that the bear was uh, overweight, old, overweight, and had bad teeth. Whoa. And when did we start uh, body shaming the animal kingdom? I think if you murder humans, you're setting yourself up to a little verbal abuse. Okay. Like if you kill a, a family of campers, I'm probably going to call you fatty <laughs> and not feel bad about it. That's it. Hey, you ate my son. Thanks, fat fuck. <laughs> oh, you mauled my daughter. Her scalp's hanging <laughs> off. Hey, you big hairy fat fuck. I'm not going to hold back. You scalp my daughter. Uh, daddy's uh, coming home, and I don't even have a daughter. And if you know, why why risk it? Well, I, I, why I have a daughter? She's just going to get killed by a bear. Going to get mauled. You why know? have kids? You're going to get emotionally attached to the child. Yeah. I wanted to have kids until I saw the TV show Euphoria. No way. There was four of them. <laughs> what? Wait. You you wanted to have four kids? No. Did you ever seen the show Euphoria? Well, why would you want four kids? <laughs> no, it's it's a television. The television. Oh what, no! What's Euphoria about? Teenagers that are like doing oh. like the worst things. Like what? Like just sex and drugs and. Well, aren't know. those the best things? Why? Didn't you get it all wrong, <laughs> Mister Rhodes? <laughs> Does somebody at this table deserve to be murdered by a bear because they got it all wrong? <laughs> Yeah. What were you doing? It sounded like you sounded like an angry cobra. Oh, there you go. What's another whistling rock song? I can't really whistle that again. Said a prayer because I'm missing you in a sin of a and I'm seeing and I'm praying. I said, woman, take it slow, cause I ain't got time no more. And you and I just need a little patience. And then you do the Whitney. Have you ever seen Whitney Houston sing? Yeah. Or some of these soul singers with 
They can't just go, I love Chinese food. They have to go, I love Chinese food. And they dislocate their jaw like an articulating <laughs> python. Or like they just swallowed a gazelle. Like keep your jaw in your face, uh, crooner lips or whatever. I don't know what to call them. I, I think that's, um, that's on our Wikipedia. Our show is being sponsored today by Blue Chew. Blue Chew. Can you believe it? Uh, Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them any time, day or night, so you can plan and be ready whenever the opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll you'll receive the prescription Within days, you'll be ready to go. The best part is it's all done online, so no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Um, So listen, uh, check it out because they always say first impressions are important, but more importantly, a lasting impression. So... Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. I mean, how simple is that? Uh, And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Harland at checkout. Just pay $5 for shipping. That's bluechew.com. Promo Harland to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast today. Hey, everybody. I want to tell you about my bookie. Yeah, my bookie. I want you to skip the arguments this Thanksgiving. Skip the arguments with Uncle Dave and focus on what really matters. Good food, boosted odds, and hitting those turkey day parlays. Yes, picture this, not just watching games, but turning every second into a potential win. With my bookie, that's M Y B O O K I E, you can stream the games and live bet them and turn any game day into a payday. Now, I don't know if you've ever bet on sports before, but it adds a whole new level of excitement to it. Every pitch, every swing, every throw, every shot when you are placing bets on on these moments as well as on a whole game, it just it it ups the adrenaline. It makes it uh, very exciting. Um, so, are you ready to up your game? Sign up today and make your first deposit with promo code Harland for a sweet deposit bonus up to a thousand dollars. That's promo code Harland to claim your bonus. This isn't just a promo code; it's your secret weapon to get the extra edge on the house and don't we all want that we always want the extra edge on the house the best part is you don't have to be a sports whiz to win at my bookie you can cash in on everything from politics to your favorite shows and then some so it's way more than just sports bet anything anytime and anywhere only with my bookie so give it a try and up your game with my bookie Up anything you do with my bookie. That's promo code Harland, and go get them. Win, win, win. Say a prayer because I'm missing you, and I can't come. (laughs) I don't know words. I, I like this country singer named Charlie Crockett. You ever heard of him? No way. I know his brother, Davey. Yeah, he's actually the son of Davey. No way. And uh, he whistles in some of his songs. Can you give me an example? Tell the truth. That's humming, Shame Tom. the devil. You're going to fool you, baby. I can't remember what parties. Can you do the whistle, though? <clears throat> I can't remember what. Um... Okay, now you're whistling. Yeah. 
Everyone can whistle but me. You just did it, though, guy. <laughs> Don't undersell yourself. I won't. You, d- you just whistled. I love that you got uh, Monument Valley on the on the wall behind Wow, you. one of the craftiest topic changers I've ever seen. <laughs> just great. Well, you get, guess what happens in the valley, guy? So I'm going to bring it right back. The wind whistles through the fucking valley. So now we're back to whistling. Let's fucking go. Nice try. Have you been to Monument Valley? Twice this year. Talk to me, guy. What are we talking about whistling for? <laughs> what, what happened? What Talk to me. It's amazing. It's okay. uh, it's on the Navajo Nation, which is really exciting to go there. You know, the Navajo, they have their own police force. And, Whoa. Um, Navajo police. Yeah. and It's, uh, in, it's in Arizona, right? It's at the, t- the top of Arizona. On, it's it's uh, in the border with Utah. And so oh, Monument wow. Valley is just like right over, right the, over the, the border. border. It's actually in Utah. And uh, it's pretty thrilling. It's, um, you know, all these great Westerns were filmed there. And then John Wayne Westerns. Do you know, do you know the official name of those structures behind me? What they're, what they're called? Well, that's a mesa, the flat one. And then the, um, the ones with the pointy tips, I don't know. Would you? Do you want to know? I do. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I just kind of awkwardly. <laughs> kind of felt like I laid it up, and then you just kind of <laughs> let it hang. And I, now I feel. I think they're called buttes. Oh, okay. But mesa. The the mesa is the flat one. It's um, not. That's not an esker. No. It's a mesa. Yeah, that's a uh, uh, which is like I. Yes, I guess it means table. It's like it's flat. The flat part is a mesa. Oh, wonder if Karen Carpenter ever bought a summer home up there. I wonder. I mean, nobody liked the flat like her. But it's pretty cool. And then the climactic scene of Thelma and Louise when they drive oh, off the right. cliff. That uh, well, was did they, filmed. Now, in, now, if we're going to be accurate, I'm starting to wonder: Did they drive off a cliff or did they drive off a mesa? Oh now wow! Now you got you got a mesa in my head, guy. Yeah. Not a lot. I don't know that I've ever had a friend or an acquaintance that's ever had the ability to pop a mesa into my brain. And you did. <laughs> so now I'm sitting here. I'm playing back probably 30 years of my life. Yeah. I'm going back to that night when I'm at the Glendale Galleria. I'm sitting in the movie theater watching Thelma and Louise with my dad. He's got his ventilator on. We get the big tub the way you do. Daddy's got a little trouble chewing, so to assist him, I pull his ventilator off, stuff popcorn in it. <laughs> just so he can, like, like, a, like, a, like a, a horse? Well, I just shove it on his, and he has to breathe, so by default, he's breathing in. You ever see, you ever see one of those, uh, those b- bingo machines where the balls are popping around oh, yeah. and they're just blowing? Yeah. So that's a, it. Was like, he's like a Darth Vader at fucking Orville Redenbacher's House of Horror Meat. Whatever. I don't know what this means, but you put a mesa in my head, and do you see where you put, it took you, me? You put whore meat into my head. I did? Yeah, just now. Do you have a story? I had a story. <laughs> <laughs> How long have we known each other, Tom? Man, we met each other in <laughs> Vancouver. Right, we probably did a, what, 25 years? No, longer than that. I think, um, I think 31, 30 or 30, wow. 30 or 31 years ago. Wow. It was 92 or 93. Mm-hmm. And we, it was a really cool, uh, they filmed comedy specials oh, for Canadian television. And I don't yeah. think the, the network exists anymore. It was like the U Network or something. <laughs> oh, God. Do you remember that? I, I, I don't. And they, I, they filmed it at the East Vancouver Cultural Center. Wow. Which was like a theater in the round with balconies. And I remember... Uh, I remember everyone your set in the have audience candles were, on it? Yeah, candles. It was the coolest backdrop with candles. And then when Ari Shafir this year put out a special and had tons of candles, it reminded me of it. It was such a great effect. Yeah, it was if you're doing a police video. Um, yeah. Uh, but it was at the Cultural Center. I always wonder, because I remember I was sitting there, and I looked out at the crowd, and virtually it was probably about 300, 500 seater at the Cultural Center. And to this day, you just sort of cracked a mystery for me. Everyone in the crowd was eating yogurt. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then when you just said that, I went, of course, yogurt, culture in yogurt. And I'm like, okay, it was the cultural. 
well, if you're going to laugh, maybe uh, <laughs> this isn't the conversation for me. It was really cool. And that's where I met you. And I remember, yeah. I remember walking around that neighborhood. Oh, walking the mean streets. We we're just walking yeah. through Vancouver. East Vancouver. It's always a bit of a wind blowing. Yeah. And I remember you still had your long hair. Yeah. And I just remember your golden locks just... They were just sort of floating on the breeze like an angel's placenta. <laughs> uh, that was my first time ever in Vancouver, and uh, wow. it's still one of my favorite cities in the whole world. Oh, God. I love Vancouver. Why? What happened there? Something else happened besides the comedy special that probably made you feel that way? Well, I, that was the first time I went, and that was an amazing experience. You and I became friends. Yeah. The, the, the special turned out phenomenal. And then I've been back. I was back many times through the years. Uh, it's now defunct, but I used to do the comedy mix on Burrard every, oh, yeah. every year. That was one of my favorite it clubs great, in the world. The one downstairs. In the basement. But you did one of, the, one of my favorite comedy specials of all time, and I told you about this. Tom did a comedy special that was so unorthodox, so out of the ordinary that I loved it. Tom went to Vietnam and did this crazy comedy special where he's slip sliding on the beach. You were eating like vamp, like giant bats. You went to the marketplace and, cobra. and, and yeah. cobra and bats. And I was like, this is astounding. And it was on its surface like... It was more. It was beyond just comedy. It was just sort of this surreal travel show almost. And then we got into the heart of it. Outside of the comedy, your father was in Vietnam, and did he do a tour of duty? He was a helicopter pilot. Yeah, my wasn't father he? flew helicopters. He was shot down, and wow, everyone in the helicopter died except for him and his co-pilot, who was knocked unconscious. Wow. And uh, my father unhooked him. Uh, 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 unhooked his safety harness, dragged him across a field, uh, and they had to wait like hours until they could be rescued. And my dad got like five, six medals for this one incident. Wow. So uh, I wanted to, I was the, kind of the face of Comedy Central the first couple of years the network was on. Yeah. And I was given the first development deal in the history wow. of Comedy Central. And I, I could basically do whatever I wanted. Nice. And then in 1995, Vietnam had just opened up for Americans to travel there. Yeah. So I pitched them this this show idea where I would go to Vietnam and have fun for the guys who went there and didn't get to have fun. Yeah. And then also to show that Vietnam was a country and not a war. Because all, yeah, right. all we ever saw was like Vietnam movies and yeah, yeah. things like that. Hostile. So, so was, there was some some great ideas. I brought Rock'em Sock'em robots, and I fought people wherever yeah, I went. That's right. And yeah. uh, I set up a slip and slide in Da Nang <laughs> yeah. on the beach. Oh, that was like da the Nang. world's most dangerous place to set up a slip and slide. Oh, and then one of the coolest things in Hanoi, uh, we and we had you know 1995 technology. Yeah. Actually, we filmed it in September '94. It came on April 1995 for the 20th anniversary of the end of the war. Um, but we had to, uh, we, we played the, there was old women doing Tai Chi in a park. Oh, and God. we showed I the. I hate it when old women beat the shit out of each other. We, Why uh, don't they just knit? We showed the, uh, the Jane Fonda workout tape. Oh, here so we go. So in 1994, that, technology. Did that start the next war? Fuck. Almost. Yeah. But we had to run uh, extension cords for like two blocks to have this TV with a um, VHS player yeah. to, to, to play it. And uh, it was really cool that, you know, Anthony Bourdain, there was that, the, the, the scene you're talking about, there was this restaurant and they served every kind of animal. Yeah. They served every kind of animal. It stuck with me. And they brought out a cobra. Yeah. And uh, they cut the, the hope. The, it's funny, the, the waiter throws the cobra down on the ground. Alive or dead? Alive. King cobra? Are we talking a, a, a king? Yeah, with the hood. The hood. Why and do they call it a hood, though? Because these people out here don't know this type of snake terminology. These ones. These, uh, these guys watching. Because they're kind of criminal? They're hoods? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so well, the waiter smacks the cobra on the nose because apparently they're more tasty if they're angry. 
Wow, okay. And, and you know, you are you're watching this and what it's about just, just kick it in the balls and make it extra delicious? <laughs> exactly. Wow. So what happened? So the cobra strikes at the guy, he leans back, he grabs the cobra by its throat, and then at the table, he they he cuts the cobra's heart out. And they wow. put the co- the cobra's heart in a shot glass, and then he drains the blood what? and puts the cobra blood in shot glasses, and then they poured vodka with the cobra. So it's vodka and cobra blood, and then they said because the 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 person of honor gets the 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 cobra heart, and the cobra heart was still beating when they yeah. put it in the shot yeah. glass. Oh, and I, they put it, and I was like the person of honor. Oh, God. and I said uh, no thanks. I'm, uh, there's no way. I said, I'll do the shot of the Cobra blood, but I'm not doing the Cobra heart. Wow. And uh, Anthony clearly had feelings for you if it was still beating. Well, Anthony Bourdain, when he went to Vietnam on his episode, he drank the shot with the Cobra heart in it. And yeah. uh, everybody wrote about it and they went crazy. So maybe I should have eaten it. Well, you said, well, wouldn't that be a cultural offense? To, to not well, that's take what they it. were saying. They were the, the people I was with were saying that they would be upset, and I was like, I don't, yeah. I don't care. You don't who, care. I don't care who gets upset. I'm not. Well, doing the, let me ask you this: to be, I the, drank the blood. Well, that's not uh, eating a beating heart. Yeah. Um, and let me ask you this: Would there be any big difference between eating a stopped heart and a beating heart? No, I mean, I don't know. Because if you're just drinking the heart that stopped beating, you know what? Maybe you could Lucky feel it, maybe you could feel it like throbbing it. as it's going down. Right? I don't know. What if it kind of went down and started, it somehow got attached to your heart, and then you had like a little like extra motor down there? That'd be kind of cool. That'd be kind of rad, but you'll <laughs> never know because you didn't. Yeah. Well, I drank the blood. How did it taste? I mean, it's, yeah, it's vodka. It's just so, ugh. it was. Well, it wasn't very pleasant. It, was it like a toxic, uh, whole chemically taste, or what was it? Mm. I, I I remember it was kind of nasty. Yeah, yeah. God, you know, you. you but hear- it was a, that that special was a really great experience, and I really, um, I loved Vietnam, and I've I've since been back there three times. Well, I don't, I don't talk about it a lot because it's, you know, but I, I actually did two tours of Vietnam. and uh, With it, the Grey Line? With Grey Line, Sun, Sun Coast bus lines. <laughs> <laughs> well. And uh, we were stationed at Holiday Inn. That was where we, like, we stayed, me yeah. and my platoon, my tour group, and two tours and air-conditioned buses and... Little TVs. It was rough, wasn't it? <sighs> but let me go. Let me go deeper because your dad. I want to get back to your dad. And by the way, if you ever, what's the name of that special? Viva Vietnam. People should watch it. I was I'm no kidding. I was really like just taken by it. I thought it was so cool and bold and adventurous, and it was so different from what comedians were doing. Because the safe thing would be to stand on the stage with the velvet curtain and cut to the crowd. And yeah. here you were like doing this outrageous stuff. So I always thought it was super courageous and, and really it fascinated me. I really loved it. Thanks, man. You know, yeah. I, I, you know it's, it's, uh, it's interesting how hindsight is twenty twenty Because, yeah. you know, I think that really gave me, it, it got great critical reviews. And yeah. uh, it, it was a big thing at the time. And then the next year, I was offered this uh, sitcom development deal with NBC. Yeah. And in retrospect, I wish I would have stayed with Comedy Central and made more shows like that. Right, because you know? those were cut from a, a more original cloth. Yeah. Whereas the sitcoms were very... Um, formulaic. Formulaic and, and cookbook. And we'll talk about those in a minute, but I, I want to get back before we skip into that. Because it fascinates me that how old were you when your did your this may be a stupid question but did you did your dad have you after he got back from Nam or were you a little no, boy I, when uh, he was in Nam? I was born in sixty seven. My dad was there in sixty nine, just for for a year. Uh, yeah, a little. Uh, yeah, I think he was there for like ten months, and then he got shot down. Wow. If he got shot down or wounded, I, I it's like a free pass to get out. Yeah. Of this. This might be a tough question, and you don't have to answer it, but did your dad 
have to shoot from the plane? Do you, did your dad have oh, yeah. to? Do you think your dad? It's hard to say. It took took a life or two. I don't know. I mean, you I never asked him. I I did. I don't. I mean, he he. You know, it wasn't. Um, it was like it, it was a a big thing of my dad's identity. Like every year, he would go to this uh, Vietnam Veterans Helicopter Pilots Association yeah. reunions. Uh, so it was a big thing for him, Vietnam, but yeah. uh, he, he didn't talk about specifics. And, like, the yeah. the specifics of him getting shot down, uh, he kind of lightly told me a couple times, but it wasn't until when he died and I found the letter from the Army uh, describing what happened to him, yeah. how, why he got the medals, uh, did I know, like, the full details. So, like, there was all these guys stuck on the ground, and they're surrounded by the North Vietnamese, you know, the Viet Cong people, and they're, yeah. they're just getting slaughtered. So my dad's helicopter flies in to try and get them, and it had taken so much heavy fire, he had to pull up and circle around. He, fi- he goes back down to try and get them. Same thing. It had so much heavy fire. Wow. He pulls up. Circles around. So he did this. He did this three times, and then on the fourth time, he goes down, and all these guys. It was maybe about twenty guys, and it's life or death. They all jump onto the helicopter. The, the American guys or the vehicle? American Kong guys. guys. Okay. The, the guys who are, are stuck. Yeah, they, they're getting, just they're, getting they're, they're the last chance to get out is yeah. your dad. So like twenty guys jump on wow. the. So it's a lot of weight to yeah. begin with. Yeah, and the, and it taken tons of uh, fire. fire. Yeah. So the helicopter is you know pulling up. And then it had taken so much heavy fire again, and it's got all this weight. It just nosedived. And my dad and his co-pilot were the only ones who survived because they were the only ones wearing safety harnesses. So wait, so all the guys that jumped on. Dead. This, oh. Yeah. How many? Like 20? Like something like that. Like, yeah, like 15, 20. So it was kind of, there was no winning. It's like if they stayed on the ground, they were surrounded by... Via Kong and would have been killed and yeah. probably not in the most glamorous way. Yeah. Or it's make a mad dash to the helicopter as your lifeline. Yeah. And all of a sudden the weight's out of balance. You're yeah. taking heavy fire. Yeah. And, I don't wow. know if it's 20 exactly, but it was somewhere like, you know, between 10 and 10, 20 guys that jumped on the thing, you know? Wow. Now, and stop me if I'm going too deep. But this is sort of fascinating to me. Did did your dad have to live with? Obviously, had to live with that. But was it hard on him? Was it hard on you? Was it hard on the family? Or was he able to re- reason with that and go, "I did the best I could." You know, the vehicle could only take so much. It was my dad was, was, a, he, my dad was pretty. He, my dad was a pretty badass guy. Yeah. So like, sounds like it. He wasn't. He wasn't shaken up by. He was like. Uh, he had all these injuries from being shot down. Like uh, his knees had surgery in his back. So he had these big like kind of skin grafts on his back and his, yeah. his legs. Scarred up. Battle scarred Scarred up. So like, you know, in the summer, see him wearing shorts, no shirt. You know, yeah. you, you could see the remnants of it. But he wasn't disturbed mentally from, yeah. from it. He, he, good, he had just good. been wounded physically. Yeah, because... Because it, he had a few... He always had a lot of Vietnam veteran friends. And a couple of these guys that used to come around to the house, they were really shaken up and still had, like, PTSD yeah. and stuff. It sounds like your dad did the best he could, and beyond heroic, taking heavy fire, did four attempts to get down there. Yeah. I mean, what more could he he do, you know? Yeah. But you know, it's wh- funny. I was always fascinated by helicopters my whole life, and I've because of my father... And then there's, uh, and you can whistle and do helicopter noises. You're the coolest. <laughs> right? Um, I've been on three helicopters in my life. Yeah. And they're terrifying. They're oh, so, really? They're so light and the wind yeah. uh, whips around. Like uh, the last one I was on, uh, I had done a benefit for the Sacramento Police Department. Maybe this yeah. is like seven, eight years ago. Yeah. At the punchline in Sacramento. And the helicopter police guys were part of the, the crowd. Yeah. And I told them about my father and oh. and uh, 
they said the next time I came to Sacramento, they would take me up on a ride along. Okay. So like a year later, I go to back to Sacramento and they, and I spent a day flying over Sacramento with wow. the police. Uh, the, the number one thing I learned is that everyone in Sacramento has got some shit in their yard they need to clean up. <laughs> yeah. Old cars, yeah. old washing yeah, machines. Yeah. Like, there's yeah. a lot of shit in the yeah. yards of Sacramento. Yeah. But it was so light. Yeah. And just even like, I don't know if you've ever been in a, a hot air balloon or... Um, no, but uh, I've been I, in I've, a few helicopters. I've been in a... I was in the, the, the Goodyear blimp once. And that also... Whoa. The, the wind shoots it around. So imagine oh, yeah. like that and you're getting shot at. Wow, I know. know. Yeah, you're, I mean, it, it, it's not an easy uh, a piece of machinery to control. It, it's like you, you're, you're kind of working levers and you're yeah. working with a, a, you, you a tail do, prop and an overhead prop. You, you, and both it's a, your feet and both your yeah, hands. It's a yeah. constant dance, yeah. yeah. So take that into consideration. You're trying to come down in a jungle. You're taking heavy fire from enemies you can't even see. You're trying to get guys on your aircraft. Let me ask you this, though, because your, your dad, you said he's a badass guy. He obviously a hero in that sense of what he did, the courage you have to have to do what he did. As a little boy, did, did you kind of look up at your dad like sort of like this kind of heroic like cowboy hero guy? Like, yeah. And, uh, my, wow. I mean, I always thought my dad was like Muhammad Ali. Yeah. You know? Oh, that's uh, amazing. I, I uh, love that. I had this image of like... For some reason, I always connected my dad with Muhammad Ali. Um, Interesting. Why? Seemed, just because he was such a heroic, badass guy. Yeah. And funny and really super charming. Yeah. And my father loved stand-up comedy. He did? And my okay. dad's the reason that I'm a stand-up comedian. Wow. Yeah. Because my dad loved... My family's originally from Washington, D.C. Yeah. And I remember as a kid driving around with my dad before seat belts, cars had seat belts. Yeah. Early 70s. And I'd, I would be standing next to my dad as he drove, and I had my my uh, arm on his shoulders. Aw. See, and, I love that. And, and my dad's were, we, my dad would be playing Richard Pryor cassettes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I remember, uh, I, I remember how, how the feeling of my dad's shoulders shaking yeah. when he laughed. Oh, nice. Listening to the prior. And I didn't understand the dirty parts. Yeah. But when prior animated animals and stuff, I just, it just killed me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so that put the seeds in my head, first of all, to be a comedian. And then in 1978, when I was 11 years old, my dad took me to my first comedy show. My uncle, my dad's brother, yeah. did open mic nights in Washington, D.C. for one year. And you went to that? My dad took me to see him. The entrance is by the door, and it was a long shotgun shack style room. Yeah. And the show was already in progress when we walked in. And I was wearing a Washington Redskins jacket. Oh, here we go. And the comedian on stage, we sees us walk in, and then he pulls me on stage, and the comedian interviewed me like I was the coach of the Redskins. And I was 11, and I just gave bashful... One word, dopey little kid yeah. answers, no and yes. But I'll never forget standing on that stage and seeing all those happy people yeah. uh, with their heads thrown back in laughter and all the teeth in their mouth. And then also watching the Mona Lisa wasn't in the crowd. Yeah, good thing. No teeth there. And uh, holding in her. Um, but, but Washington, D.C. is a very, you know, international city. Yeah. So uh, in my mind, I know I've romanticized it, but I just remember like, all flavors of humanity yeah. were there. And so it just seemed to me when you were on stage as a comedian, you were talking to the world. Right, right. Uh, so from that moment onward, I never, ever considered you were hooked. anything else in my life. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Changed my life forever. Wow. Yeah, my dad drove me to my first two open mic nights, too. Was your dad, when you walked down the street with him as a kid, were you, were you like, did, did the other kids know your dad's history, like being the, the pilot? Like, were you kind of like, my dad's like, cool, he's a badass? I, I think everyone, I think people knew. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have brothers? Uh, yeah. Yeah. What's that smile? <laughs> oh, here we go. Here we go. Fuck. <clears throat> Let's just say I'm not very close with him. Yeah. What happened, Tom? Uh, 
let's 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 keep it. Let's, let's not let's go keep there. It happy. Yeah. Just sit here quietly for a second. I'm gonna try and figure it out in my head. Look into your eyes and see if I can. I'm telling you. Yeah. Telepathically. Do it. For real. <laughs> Um, no, don't. You don't have to tell me. I'm just seeing if I can pick up on it. Yeah, I'm good at reading energy. Like, is there something in your life? And I picked up on this before you even got here. I could be way wrong. Was there something in your life that had to do with cold and freezing? Something that happened in your life that involved freezing temperatures or something frozen? I could be way off, but mm. I just I had this thing. And I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just asking, but maybe there's nothing. But I felt like there was something. Mm, I've been cold before, but I not, not nothing like <laughs> I you've experienced. I don't think it's I'm sure. you got up and turned the thermostat up, guy. I, I thought maybe there was a big, like, some kind of experience. But I guess my radar's off. And because of that, I'll never know what you and your brothers are going through, too, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a medium I'm they, just a rare. They can't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, buddy, let's quickly shift gears to hummingbirds. There's one thing we we love to talk about. You have hummingbirds at your house. I want to get into this. Yeah, I have hummingbirds come to my balcony every day. But you let them in your house. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, accidentally. I've, I've, oh. I've, I've, I've put up a, uh, one of these screens that okay. has the slit in the middle. Um, so not really a screen at all, just an opening. Yeah, but, but you know that's they're for doorway things. Well, um, it's a screen, and they're you, you know so they're, you can go in and out. Well, usually, but I but the reason I, I I just put it up a couple months ago because I I I I, I don't want any more. Uh, I had one hummingbird oh. die. Oh no! What did it hit the dartboard? I uh, well well just. Um, Hummingbirds are attracted to music. I'm always playing music. And then I've had, since I've lived in my apartment, uh, three times, four times. Wait, is that true, that theory? Yeah. Hummingbirds are attracted to music? Because now I'm picturing, like, you know, Iron Maiden doing an outdoor concert and them getting, like, stabbed to death. It could be. Just like a flock of hummingbirds coming. (laughs) Run for the hills. (laughs) Run for your life. I mean, what are you, you talking? Did you just or, make that up? Uh, hummingbirds love music. No, I'm, I'm I'm full of all kinds of hummingbird hummingbird knowledge. Um, <laughs> but I've, I've, I'm going to take a side detour here for a oh, second. Oh, here we go. Here uh, we go. The Seven Eleven by <laughs> where, my apartment. Uh, they blast classical music because apparently homeless people don't like classical music. Oh, they you've hate seen, it. You've seen they this? So oh. like it apparently it drives homeless people away. Oh, I had a homeless guy near my house about three weeks ago put yeah. on some Tychowski and he jumped in front of a bus. <laughs> they hate but, it. But this is what kills me. There's one homeless guy who's always in front of it. It doesn't work on yeah, him. Yeah, he's going like this. <laughs> Yeah, he's got like a bread stick and a yeah. fucking uh, Slim Jim, and he's like, dun 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 dun, dun 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 dun, dun 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 dun. He's like conducting people in and out of the Seven Eleven. Yeah, buy some chips, <laughs> buy a donut, dun 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 dun, get some milk. All right, enough of that. Um, so what happened? So I've had hummingbirds come and yeah. get stuck in my apartment, oh, and no. then uh, above the door, I have, there's uh, I've got really tall ceilings, and there's a massive picture window, and so they'll 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 freak out, and they're banging into the into the window. They oh. can't figure out to come down. Oh god! And it's happened. If it, it's happened uh, three or four times, so I have to wait for them to get tired, and then when they get tired, they get down to the bottom, oh. and then I've got this little net. That uh, I I get up on a stool and then I, I put this net over them and just very gently I, I've taken them out and I remember there was one it's always the dominant so I have this hummingbird feeder on on my balcony okay and there's always one dominant I used to have multiple dominant what there's always one dominant hummingbird can you be dominant when you're only this big yeah the hummingbirds okay. are they're nasty little bastards whoa. Whoa, easy guy. <laughs> oh, fuck. 
There's always a dominant one okay. that chases the other ones away. Okay. Because it's like a flying lawn dart. Because flowers have a limited amount of nectar. And right. they can't differentiate that a hummingbird nectar feeder never runs out from the person who loves them who keeps filling it up. up. Yeah. They think there's a limited amount of nectar. So they so how to see these little aerial combats right, all the right. time where they're chasing away uh, first couple of years I lived there, I thought that they were dancing or playing or yeah. ma- mating or like, something. But <laughs> during the pandemic, when I was stuck in my apartment, every, I would sit there and I would Google everything they did. Like oh, wow. when the hummingbird makes clicking noises, it sure. it means that they're they're being dominant and <sighs> uh, claiming their their territory. Okay. okay. So I had this one hummingbird got stuck in my apartment the first time it happened. And then I, I gently got him down, take him out of the balcony, and I, I released him. How and did it, you do it? Like, why well, I, I have this? I, it, it's actually an old. It's a hair it, it's, it's a beach bag. It's like a net because, like, so sand you know falls through the, the netting. A cello? Yeah, uh, but what, <laughs> that's an old reference. <laughs> wasn't that a beach bag? Wasn't that one of her movies? Oh, yeah, beach blanket bingo. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, like, two days later, yeah. I'm standing on my, my balcony having coffee. Oh, God. And this humming, after I released it, and this hummingbird comes up, like, right in front of my face. And he just hovers there for Let a, me guess, a, you grabbed him and stirred the coffee? <laughs> yes. Oh. Um, so he just looked at me for, like, a full minute. And then, wow. he, and then he buzzed off. That's and, a lot of hovering, by the way. And I know it was the one that I saved. Oh. And I know he, like, came back and he was like, you know, I had time to think about what happened. Aww. And I realized you were trying to help me. And I just wanted to say thank you. Wow. So, so Well, they don't really say thank you. I think he would have hummed thank you, right? But mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. Yeah. They're hummingbirds. Yeah. They're sure. not uh, talking birds, Tom. Why, why do hummingbirds hum? Because they smell like cunt. <laughs> <laughs> God, I don't, so I don't, where did that even come Where did that even come from? I was about to hit you with an innocent children's joke. Dude, and why? Where did that even come from? What's the real answer? Let's move on. The um, it's, it's it's a children's joke. You know that joke. No, what is it? Why do hummingbirds hum? Because they don't know the word. They don't know the lyrics. Oh, okay. It's like it's a, it's a kid's well, joke. Well, they should know the lyrics. They love music. I mean, apparently, they should know all the lyrics. They should be in front of the 7-Eleven with that homeless they guy. They should be. God. Yeah. I'll tell you what, though. The the worst experience I uh, had with hummingbirds was uh, my neighbor. He's this kid. He, uh, he was out in the yard screaming one day. <laughs> he was like 14. Did you ever get zits? Of course. Yeah, so this kid had a face like a Chinese roasted pizza. <laughs> One day he was out in the yard screaming. I looked over the fence, and you ever get the zits with all the pus? Oh, yeah, the little uh, volcano. Yeah, this kid had about 19 hummingbirds sucking pus out of this, hovering, licking the pus out of his zits. Unreal. It's like a Stephen King horror wow. movie. Yeah. That, that, that'd be a good way to pop them. Yeah, yeah just get a hummingbird to suck them. But can I bore you with some more hummingbird facts? Oh, please, I love this. And my audience, by the way, this is this is just, we didn't plan this. Uh, we, didn't, did, we didn't orchestrate this. I just happen to be one of the few podcasts out on the net that has a huge hummingbird audience. They love it. So please. <laughs> okay, so the uh, Los Angeles has got indigenous hummingbirds that are here year-round. The Anna and the Allen hummingbirds. Oh, my God. And uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, one, they've got, like, green bodies and the little ruby throat. The other um, one has a wrench. And then the, uh, the, I think the other one is gray. Well, but it has a wrench. So this is the from Allen the last wrench. couple of years of, of being obsessed with hummingbirds. Yeah. The most special hummingbird, in oh my opinion. Oh, my God. There's retards. <laughs> That's... Uh... <laughs> Oh, you said it, I, not me. You said it. I didn't. I didn't say it. So, how special are they? What no. do you mean they're special? The most special hummingbirds yeah. are the Rufus hummingbirds. Oh God! And yeah. these are the orange ones. I'm sure you've seen the orange ones. Yeah, yeah, I have. So, the orange hummingbirds are the Rufus hummingbirds, mm-hmm. and the reason why I think they're so special is because their entire life 
is a constant state of migration. They go from Mexico all the way up the West Coast to Alaska, and then, uh, you know, through Canada, down into Colorado, and then back down to Mexico. So with the seasons, and then these hummingbirds live to 10 or 11 years old, and they can do this cycle. Yeah, It takes them a whole year to go around. So it's like uh, they can do it like 10 times in their life. Wow. And uh, so they're only in Southern California for like a few months before they move on. Right. And then, and then hummingbirds always remember where they got nectar. Like I saw all the flowers that you have yeah. where the hummingbirds were hitting it. All They'll them. always return because they drop a pin in their brain. They always return wow. to where they got nectar. I see. And to where a kind person. But what, what the, causes the orange pigment in their, in their feathering? They eat too much carrots. Just constantly eating carrots. Hummingbirds eat carrots. No, I'm just being silly. Well, it makes sense. I thought maybe they ate oranges because oranges grow on trees and birds are up at elevation. Hummingbirds could get to an orange, whereas a carrot grows underground. I've never seen a burrowing hummingbird, but I figure if they picked up enough speed, they could kind of dive bomb and get down to a carrot. They only, they like, they prefer carrot cake, I think. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's the middle ground. Great. Boy, that took a long time to get. That was one of the longest pauses in the history of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think we needed to get there, though. We needed it. I, I, I should have whistled. Well, you don't know how, remember? <laughs> so that would have been, well... Yeah, I'm Why can't you whistle, though? That's a, a very standard thing. Why is it hard, though? As a little boy, did you not whistle? I did. I'd spent a long time. It's not that tough. Yeah. You got it, guy. I'm on it. Um, Why don't we start a whistling club? Okay. Yeah. When, where, and how many members? We could eat at my place, your place... Let's do it at your place. Okay. Because we got the whistling, you throw in the humming, and then we can just, in about a year of practice, just make it a barbershop quartet place. We'll invite the guy from the 7-Eleven with the breadstick and the beef jerky, and yeah, he can conduct. Bing, bang, boom, baby. <laughs> Next thing you know, we're selling about. So. Why are you squeezing your tits? <laughs> you know. I'm imagining the future. Are you going to trans? Are you going to? You're going to do the trans thing? I'm going to get a, a tattoo of an eagle on my chest? No, you said you're imagining the future. You're squeezing your breath, <laughs> so I thought maybe you're going to transition. Trans Ams, remember they had the eagle. Oh, the they had the, was that an eagle or a phoenix? Was it a phoenix? On, was, the, on, was the, that, on the hood a, of a Trans Am, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Was it an eagle I don't know. or a phoenix? That's a question for you, the viewer. It's too bad Burt Reynolds died. He could answer this he question. He did? Yeah. When? So maybe because you don't remember, it's possible he's still alive. It could be. You just sort of ended a guy's career before it needed to end. Who, who, who's who's going to make WWE and the Dixie Dance Kings too if he's not living anymore? I would like. I you, am. You'd be great in that. That's why I put my hand up, guy. WW and the Dixie Dance Kings too. Right here. Fuck off. Everyone, just fuck off. <laughs> uh, let's go real quickly. We gotta talk about Burning Man. We oh. were both there this year. <clears throat> Come on, guy. Yeah, what'd you think? Well, this my it was my sixth time. So you're really into it. Oh yeah. You, you love it. Was it your first? It was my first one, yeah. Well then let's hear what you thought about it, because you were the virgin. Okay, first of all. I want to know, what is your Burning Man name? Izzy Lizzy. Seriously? Yep. Okay. Izzy, when, when you go to Burning Man, you have to create a profile, and you create a, a it's called a burner name. Like, but somebody else has to give you the name. Oh, they do? That's what I was told. Oh, I gave it to myself. Oh, okay. Izzy Lizzy. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's yours? Radiant. So you're like one, one word, like share. 
Yeah. Radiant. Radiant. Who gave it to you? These, uh, the to- these topless Canadian women who were across the road from where I was Whoa. staying. Did you give them a name? Uh, they already had them because they were like, they've been, oh. uh, uh, Squirrel was was one woman's name and then oh. the other woman's, um, I forget what the other woman's name. Parsnip? <laughs> Rabbit, maybe. I don't know. Hummingbird? <laughs> Uh, no, Rex, uh, Rex was the other one's oh. the, was the other one's uh, burner name. Uh, yeah, this woman told me I had a radiant smile. Oh, you and do. And she said, from the moment I first saw you across the road, Whoa. I felt that you were radiant. That's so, that's apropos. So, so she um, and as a woman uh, from Canada, did you end up? It sounds like that's the kind of a lead in line to a little romance. Did you have a little romance with uh, the, the young squirrel? I did not. Were you hoping you would? Was there a temptation? Was there a... I... 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 I, I yeah. yeah. I mean, it that's was... A, that's a yes. That's a very long, long yes. Yeah. Ooh, whenever someone goes, Ooh, yeah, you, uh, it's either Helen Keller stuck in an elevator or it's a long-winded yes. Yeah. And then there was some other fabulous Canadians to my okay. right, and she got together with this wonderful... Uh, Canadian guy from Banff, and oh, Banff. Um, uh, and uh, these people were all amazing human beings. And just so people know, Banff is a small mountain town in British in uh, in uh, Manitoba, and it's also the sound you get if you is hit it, an old it, lady it, in it, the it, head with a canoe paddle. <laughs> Banff, is it not in Alberta? It's in Alberta, yeah. What did you, I say? You said Manitoba. Oh, Manitoba, sorry, Alberta. Manitoba's two provinces over. I should know I lived in Banff. And I... Uh, yeah. You out Canadian the Canadian. <laughs> or was I, I just testing the, you? It's because I listen to the CBC all the oh, time. Oh, God. But no, um, <laughs> these people were so cool, and they gave me gifts. The guy from... Uh, I'm dead. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I'll take over the show. Uh, okay, then I'm back. Fuck that. Uh, <laughs> the guy from Banff, yeah. Banff gave me a necklace with a grizzly claw on it. Was it a grizzly or a black bear? You said grizzly. How big was the claw? It's I'd say like the like the size of my pinky. Yeah, that's probably a grizz. He and gave it to you. Gave it to me. Really cool guy. Really wilderness people. And then he also gave me another necklace that uh, uh, was a bison. It is a bison tooth. Oh, this guy sounds like he hates animals. Yeah. Uh, he, he really, really, really cool people. What was the origin of the bear claw? Did he tell you where, where, how he acquired it? No, I guess, you know, in Canada, these things are just lying everywhere, right? I don't know. Well, I brought something <laughs> out because in, in you know, I, you showed me your bear claw when we were at the comedy store okay. a few months ago. Yeah. And we talked about it, and I said, "If ever, when you get you up here on the podcast, we'll talk about it, because I have a bear claw necklace. <gasps> Look at this. Wow. So, Are you kidding me? So this is a black bear, and the big long things, of course, are the teeth, and the smaller ones are the black bear claws. Wow. And uh, I thought I'd pull that out because I knew you had your bear claw. Now, you were going to bring it today, but you forgot. But that's okay. And you out claw- you out bear clawed me. This is uh, this well, is so no, cool. Well, the, the reality is you out bear clawed me because a grizzly bear is twice the size of a black bear. So your claws, as you said, would be a, a lot longer. And the Yeah, teeth. but I don't have the teeth. Well, wow. do you, you want to hear the origin story yeah, for that? totally. So it's pretty interesting. I used to be a ranger a forest ranger when I was younger. Yeah. And I was at this remote camp in the woods, and some of the guys who were working in the kitchen, I didn't like this part of it, but they um, they would throw scraps of food out the back door of the kitchen after the meals were over, and inevitably it attracted a big old bear and these guys were sort of douche bonnets, and they kept luring this thing in and luring it in. And one day, they just shot it. Oh, wow. Which was not cool. It that broke cool. my heart. And so I didn't know what happened with the bear. And one day when I was out on one of my runs, I could smell death in the air. You know, we were out in a forested area, obviously. 
And I literally just followed my nose. You could smell the decomposition of flesh. And I had an inkling that it was probably the bear they shot. This was, you know, probably about four or five days later. I followed that scent through the woods and came to the carcass of a full-grown black bear. And this thing, you know, laying on its back, let's say this is the forest floor. I mean, these things, they're girthy. And I said, okay. I saw the bear, and I was sad that it was shot, and I thought, I'm not going to let this guy go to waste. They, but they, I've got these pliers, and those teeth look kind of cool. Well, they sort of just wasted this life of yeah. this beaut. To me, it was a beautiful animal, and they sort of tricked it. They lured it in, and they, they ended its life yeah, it in sounds a horrendous. cruel way. And so it was amazing how fast nature works. But this bear was like this and I kept my eye on it and I went back about five days later and the maggots had reduced it to about this high on the forest floor. Carcass open, you could see the spinal column. It was awful, it smelt like hell. But obviously I had my ax and I was like, you know what, I cut the head off, I cut the paws off and I eventually cut the claws out. Did you really? Yeah. This, this is them right here. Wow. And then I took the skull and I pulled the teeth out of the skull. And I thought, I'm not going to let this bear go to waste. And I got the drill and I drilled it in and I put them on leather. And I've had this thing with me my whole life almost. And so that bear's memory lives on. And this is sort of a symbol of a part of my life that was wild and in nature and connected to the earth and the creek God's good creatures and God and and so this uh, this actually hangs right by my bed on my light. It it stays with me. It's it's a it's a keepsake from uh, you know they've had with me my whole life. So cool. There did you, you, go. Do you used to, did, What did you do with the head? The head I actually uh, had the skull. I, I kept the whole skull. I put it in bleach, and I had the head until recently. It actually I was doing some uh, cleaning, and I knocked it, and it broke. It fell, and it sh- sort of shattered, and I had to get rid of it. Mm. But I had that with me for many, many years. So there's the little story behind the old bear claw. That's bear fantastic. Isn't that wild? That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's too bad those people killed that beautiful animal. It's awful. But, but in a way that, that that beast lives on and it's given me, you know, you know, many people, especially indigenous people, find spirit in animals and in nature. And, you yeah. know, the uh, aboriginals in Australia find spirit in rocks and twigs and leaves. There's, there's spirit in everything. And so I hope in some way I kept that bear's spirit alive by keeping this alive in the world and, and in my life. So I think that's really awesome that you did. You, you have that. Where were you a ranger? Uh, this was in northern Ontario, all through northern Ontario, up on the shores of Lake Superior. Unbelievable. place called Nays. Why does that lake think he's better than everyone else? I know, right? Yeah. I don't know. Can you imagine if Lake Superior was filled with great white sharks? Probably the most racist lake <laughs> on the globe. <laughs> Hummingbirds, black bears, hummingbirds, grizzly bears, great white sharks. What haven't we covered here today, my boy? Hmm. Uh, yeah, what? Um... No, I wanted, I really wanted to talk. I'm glad you shared about your dad. Because, you know, ever since you you told me about that way back when, I always, I always thought, you know, my dad comes from a whole different world. My dad's cut from a whole different cloth. And I always thought... Must be so cool to have a dad like that, just holding his hand, walking through the park, and you know, I was just—I don't know—it it always stuck with me, your dad. So I'm glad I got a chance to talk to you about it, and you shared. Yeah, my dad was a cool guy. When I when I started out, we moved to Florida when I was 12. Yeah. So I started out in Florida as a comedian, and then I, you know, started doing the Southern circuits. And this is before the internet, you know, before yeah. cell phones. Can you believe we lived dad before would ask the me internet? To, Jesus. Yeah, those were yeah. the days. My dad would ask me to write down where I was playing. Oh, your shows. Yeah, yeah. so I remember, and I'm like, I'd be in like Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Right. At like a Holiday Inn. And my dad would come walking in. He would no. just, he would just like, great. he would show up sometime. My dad did a, it was really <laughs> awesome. And then, oh. 
Uh, he was he, he loved Viva Vietnam, and then when I had my sitcom, yeah, my dad lived in Los Angeles, and he sat in the front row uh, for every taping. <sighs> So he was a, he was a big fan, great supporter. Is he still with us, your dad? Uh, killed by a drunk driver in two thousand and nine in Anaheim. Yep. Sorry, buddy. I know it was a rough one. Isn't that interesting? How a guy is willing to put his life out there, and it just seems so sad when it's such a senseless death. Yeah, that he survived uh, war. Yeah. And then gets taken out. By a guy on vodka. Yeah. yeah. Not cool. Not cool. <clears throat> Not cool, man. Well, I'm glad you, you had a beautiful uh, relationship with your dad and the years you had together sounded fantastic and that you were able to look up to him and he was sort of a... a Why do you say your father was different? My father was a very sort of a stoic kind of, uh, you know took more of a traditional path in life, was a lawyer and a politician. And so it wasn't, I, I, I look at your dad and, and my dad was a great guy, a good, very good man, but your, your dad's, your dad comes from such more of a dramatic place th than mine, you know? Yeah. And, and it sounds like you had a pretty tight, you know how you said you, you weren't tight with your brothers? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like me with my dad. Okay. So if you want to look into my eyes now and see if you can I'll, figure out. Okay. I got it. I hear you. Yep. Oh, no. I'm sorry that happened. <laughs> well, if you're going to laugh, I mean, God. <laughs> you know, oh, God, God. You'll never <laughs> share with me again. You'll never open up like that again. I'll never open my eyes to you again. Hey, can I tell you a cool story about Monument Valley when I was there a couple weeks ago? Sure. So, um, the, I stayed in this town, Kayenta, Arizona, and it's on okay. the Navajo Nation. Yes. And, uh, there was one movie theater and so I was there for a couple of days. I had yeah. gone earlier this year mm -hmm. and spent a couple of days there. I liked it so much. I went back Great. and, um, I went to this theater because it's a tiny little town and there's one theater and they were playing, um, Killers of the Flower Moon, the, okay, the new Scorsese yeah. movie. Which is based on Native American culture. Yeah, the Osage yeah. Uh, tribe in Interesting. Oklahoma. Interesting, okay. Uh, Appropriate place to watch phenomenal it. Phenomenal movie. So, these, so the, the, the Navajo people that I met when I went earlier this year and when I was back this time were the sweetest, most wonderful people. Good. And this theater, uh, the, the, it turned out, they're giving away, there was all these posters movie posters are given away and there was really sweet uh teenager people uh that were working there and this woman who was the manager and i go are these free and they're like yeah and then i start talking to them oh and it costs six dollars for a movie wow. team. unbelievable How so much the movie the giant tub of popcorn they gave it to me for free Sick. So the movie theater was going out of business the next day. Oh, that popcorn and must have tasted like shit. <laughs> it was. It was. Oh. It was, hey, it was <laughs> the waiter, there's hair in my popcorn. It was pretty, but but it was. So these were like, the, uh, and and these were like the sweetest people. They they they're all in Navajo and talking to them and. Um, so you went to the final showing. The, the final theater? showing, and they were saying that the the it's owner had like undercut their pay and like he had, he didn't sound like uh and he's giving away did, free popcorn didn't sound like a night well they were going out of business so they were so they, yeah. didn't, they didn't care right and then there was this massive poster of killers of the flower moon yeah and i'm talking to them and i go hey i can't have that poster can i and they go yeah why not so me i got up on this this me and these uh, this this teenager yeah uh guy and indian I, kid uh, Native American. Um, we're, uh, we, Is that a slam to say Indian now? You can't say Indian? I, I mean, I, I, I mean, in Canada, you call them indigenous people, right? Right, or, but or First is, Nations. But is it is it still wrong to like? Is it? I, I'm just. I'm being serious. Is is it uh, considered slanderous to, to say the term Indian? I have no idea. I, I just, don't either. That's I, why I, I said it. I stay I away hope from. Not. I I just stay away from it, and I I, I never use it. Isn't I, it funny how we have to dance around everything now? Yeah. Like every everybody's title is changing. Like I'm I'm half Irish. I'm wondering when the day comes when you can't call us Irish. You have to call us 
potato drunks or whatever. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, like it's just you, you, you I'm know, a you, quarter potato drunk, right? Yeah. yeah, it's almost like you're afraid to talk about anyone's culture anymore because no matter what you do, someone wants to peg you for for being an asshole about it. But yeah. anyways, keep going. You got the big. But I had this like wonderful, poster. wonderful experience, and it was this massive poster. It yeah. wasn't it wasn't like the normal size movie poster. It was yeah, like the big it was ones. the lobby poster, the big lobby one, and it was such a cool memory. I mean, I loved uh, Monument Valley so much. I went back, but then this time. It was such a cool memory of me and this, you know, 15-year-old Navajo guy. He's helped me take the staples yeah. out and oh. rolling it up. And uh, it was really cool. So I have a massive movie poster of that. That's what she said. But the charm of finding those those little movie houses in the, those small towns, yeah. they're, they're so... That when you talk about going to the movies being magical, yeah. when you find these little... Last stand movie places that still charge like five dollars, yeah. and you go in and you can smell the. But they're the best. There's a there's a place out in California here called Twenty Nine Palms. It's out by Joshua Tree. Yeah, and they still have a drive-in movie theater. Oh wow! Where it's two hits, you get to see two big hits for like four fifty. And you line up at the thing, and you wait to go in, and the sun's going down, and there's Joshua trees next to the speakers, and you hand this, hang the speaker on your car, and there's the you have to get out and walk to the snack bar. It's like yeah. if you ever want to go, like the the charm of that stuff's like hard to find nowadays. Wow! So there's yeah. it really still. I would love to drive out there oh, just to go to the just to do that. I I took a girlfriend out there for her birthday. I said. What are we doing for my birthday? I said, I'm, we're driving out to 29 Palms, and we went to the drive-in theater. And, it, and you know, you got that warm desert air out there. So yeah. it's like, it's just like, it's so charming. Um, but anyways. Why um, do we ever have to get out of our car? Yeah. Yeah. That's what the uh, guy in the trunk said out in <laughs> Mafia Valley. Um, That's cool to know. I'll go check out that Go theater. check that out. I'll let you know. And now it's time for our final segment, Tom. Words from a wooden shoe. Yes, this hey, is an authentic Just because Dutch I clock. lived in Amsterdam? Well, see, here's the thing with Tom. There's so much I didn't get to, and you're going to come back. Yeah. Because, one, we didn't get to your world travels, which I know you've done extensively. And, two, Tom and I took a very similar trajectory. You brushed on it earlier about your sitcom on NBC, uh, Mr. Rhodes. And you and me at the same time had sitcoms on the air. I had Simon with me and Jason Bateman, and you were doing Mr. Rhodes. And it's a whole world of entertainment experience that I'm sure we have stories we could tell. Yeah. But I want to save it for next time when we can really elaborate on it, not just brush over it. But I, I think me and you took a very similar trajectory on many areas of our careers. So... I want to get to that, but for the end of this segment, for your first visit down the Harland Highway, uh, you reach into the shoe. There's words in this wooden shoe. You pull one out, read it, and see if it uh, triggers a story or a memory from your life or from okay. someone else's life. So reach okay. in there, this buddy. great. I'm actually going to uh, Holland next week. Well. I'm excited. Name dropper. Here we go. Take that one. What do you got? Read it out loud. Camping. Oh, here we go. I hate camping. And my family, we went camping when I was a kid once. Oh. And my mother still talks about it. Um, the raccoons came and ate our food. We couldn't sleep at night. We could just hear these, um, these I don't know why we left food outside. Yeah. But um, my, my mom had brought a cake, and then they came and they got in the cake. <sighs> wait, wait, wait. You brought a pastry camping? Oh, my, my mom. Where'd you camp? In the mall <laughs> parking lot? What the <laughs> fuck? Is, uh, raccoons? We had, four, we had four kids. My mom brought, um, uh, she, I remember she brought, she brought a, a cake. cake. Anyway, but none of us liked Nothing it. Nothing like we, roughing it in the wilderness <laughs> with a fucking double chocolate mint chip fucking cake. Was it Sara Lee or Peppery <laughs> Farm? Do you remember? My mother made it from Lucky scratch. Lucky you survived, huh? Yeah, my mother made it from scratch. Oh, no, she had psoriasis? She went through a period of, uh, <laughs> yeah. She went through a period where she was making cakes all the time. <laughs> well, it sounds Which is like cool, because there'd be those little uh, icing squirters all over the kitchen. You could just go in there and get a big squirt of sugar. But <laughs> that was the thing about Burning Man. You probably yeah. went there in a big RV or something. Yeah. 
I with a cake. A friend of my uh, a, a, a friend of mine had had an extra ticket, invited me, and I slept in a shift pod, and. Uh, it was freezing at night. Yeah, you don't there. you don't go to Burning Man unless you have an RV. That's what. That's I, why that's, you hate camping. That's what I learned. And uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, no showering, and then yeah. and then having to use the porta potties. You never had Ooh. to use the porta potties. Well, that's why you? you bring a, your own trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I know. My mother, I told her, yeah, that the worst part of Burning Man was that people don't bathe. And that a lot of people had some serious body odor at Burning Man. And my mother goes, um, honey, I, I never, she's really religious. She goes, I never thought about this before, but the people in the Bible lived in the desert. And I guess the people in the Bible, a lot of them didn't smell very good. And I said, yeah, mom, maybe that's where John the Baptist came up with the idea to baptize people. And she was like, that's funny, honey, but you can never say that on stage. So now she's, she's editing you? That's what I'm saying. No camping, and now this. <sighs> she like should have taught me to whistle. Looks like you just got a big slice of edit cake. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tommy, before we leave, please uh, tell the folks where they can see you, their, your website, your your comedy tour, your, your social media, if you're plugging a book or an album, or tell these folks where they can get some Tom Rhodes action guy at underscore Tom Rhodes on Instagram. And, um, I'm going to be, uh, wow. I'm going to be in Europe for the next, um, couple weeks. I don't have, um, wow. Um, I'm going to be different places. Find me. Well, I'm busy. <laughs> oh, and I have a, I have a lovely podcast called Tom Rhodes smart camp. Tell them where they can see it. Uh, Wait a minute! You have a it's called Smart Camp, and yeah. you hate camping. Yeah, well, yeah, Wait, something's not <laughs> adding up here, uh, Captain it, Cake. It, it's smart to not go camping unless you have an RV. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, okay. That's the that's well. The tell them where they can see your uh, podcast, guy. Uh, it's wherever you can find podcasts on iTunes and um, YouTube, and you know all that good stuff. Yeah, and I, uh, I I talk to smart people about things that I'm passionate about. So I'd love to have you on. I think I might be exhausted. But I think we I think we covered it all, right? No, we got lots more to talk about. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, check out Tom Rhodes, hilarious comedian. Find out where he's at. Go to Europe if you have to. Bring him a cake. Tommy, thanks for being on the Harland Highway today, man. You I love you so much, Harland. Love you, buddy. And we've had a long relationship. And I think this is the longest conversation we've gone for, like, straight. You know, we've, yeah. we've, we've hung out and talked, but this has been a nice, long talk with Tommy Rose. Can you believe we've known each other for 30 years? <sighs> man, it makes me want to just throw a hummingbird in your face. <laughs> Um, that's it for today, folks. Uh, let's hit the theme music. Uh, until next time, everyone, Tom Rhodes, I'm Holly William, and we'll see you next time. And until then, chicken chow mein, baby. Jeff you have fun, Tom? Very much so. Want to go to 7-Eleven? I do. Let's sit in front. Let's name the composers as, yeah. the, as each song comes on. That's Vivaldi. That's my guy. Bach. Bach. <laughs> I'm supposed to say that like with a guttural. <laughs> you know, we ended we ended about thirty seconds ago, guy. You can't can't keep doing stuff. <laughs> God, selfish. God. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I love you, Harley.